questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Zach, I heard you passed your driving test. Congratulations. Thanks Olivia, I passed just last week. It feels great to be independent and driving on my own. I really want to take driving lessons, but I haven't been able to find a driving school that will give lessons during the weekends, so that I don't have to miss any classes at college. The driving school that I used was brilliant and really flexible with their teaching hours. It's really close to the school. The address is 67 Kings Road. That's 67 King, apostrophe S, Road. Oh, that's perfect. I don't like the idea of driving around busy streets. Did your teacher make you drive in urban areas, or did he mainly teach you on roads in the countryside? My teacher said that I had to learn on both in order to become a good and experienced driver. We would start in the city centre and then drive north above the city. He sounds like a good teacher. Would you mind giving me his contact details so I can ask him for lessons? Of course. My mother's friend Daniel Smith referred me to him. His name is Alan Sutcliffe. Could you spell the surname, please? S-U-T-C-L-I-F-F-E Thanks for helping me out. I'll give him a call tomorrow. I don't know if I should learn in a manual or automatic car. How do I decide? I wasn't sure which type of car to learn in either. In the end, I chose to learn in a manual car, because once you've learnt how to drive manually, you can drive automatic as well. Most cars on the road are automatic nowadays. OK, I think I'll learn with a manual car too then. Hopefully the teacher will be able to give me lessons in the evenings after school. It would be much better if you take the lessons during the day. It will be far easier for you to learn when there is enough daylight to clearly see everything going on around you. But you need to be an experienced driver to drive safely at night. How frustrating. I was hoping I wouldn't have to take lessons during the weekends. You're right though, safety comes first. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Speaking of safety, you should wait until summer to start learning. It's really difficult and dangerous to drive in the wind and rain as a learner, so you should definitely wait until the weather is sunny and dry. OK, that's perfect, actually. It will give me some time to save up some money to pay for the lessons. Tell me about it. I had to work for months before I had enough money saved up. It was worth all the work when I finally got my driving licence, though. The whole process is so expensive. How much did it cost you in the end? Well, each half-hour lesson cost $30, and then the final test cost $50. In total, it cost me about $300. Gosh, it's pretty expensive. How did you find the test? Was it really difficult? No. It wasn't too bad, and the man was really calm and friendly. I knew that I would have to perform two parking manoeuvres during the test, so I practised them a lot beforehand, and that really helped. 
The test used to last 40 minutes, but it changed a bit. For the first 20 minutes of the test, he gave me directions, and I had to just drive around. And then the last 10 minutes was for demonstrating the manoeuvres. So the test is 30 minutes in total. OK, great. I'll remember that. Do you have any more advice? It's really good to practice driving a lot outside of driving lessons as well. Whenever my parents were running errands on the weekends, I would offer to drive them. My driving teacher also told me to buy a notebook to write down everything that I've learnt in it, like a diary. Ha <laughs> ha! That sounds boring, but I'll do it if it helps. I found it really useful. Before my test, I read through everything I had written down and it reminded me of a lot of things that I had forgotten about. It's really helpful for the theory test as well because there's so much information to remember for it. That's great, Zach. Thanks for your help. No problem. See you at school. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear a telephone conversation about opening a bank account. Expats Helpline, Terry Davies here. What can I do for you? Hello, Terry. I've been in this country for a while, and I've just been offered a job in the city, so I think I'm going to need to open a bank account. I haven't had one before, so I'm wondering what papers I need. Well, basically, you'll need to be able to prove to the bank that you're who you say you are and that you live where you say you do, okay? Uh-huh. And for some banks, at least, that means you'll have to show them two separate pieces of identity. So I'll run through the list if you like. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. I'll bring it up on the screen. Let's see. Here it is. Right. The first thing it says is a valid passport. Mine's Australian. Yes, that would be fine, of course. The next one is a driving license. And again, one from your country would be OK. Then that's followed by birth certificate. Oh, hang on. That's only if you're under 18. Which I'm not. Right. So not that then. But you can also show them a benefit book. For instance, if you're in ill health, or unemployed, or getting income support? Yes, I could bring that. Or a letter from my employer, maybe? Well, that's not actually on the list, so we'll have to assume you can't. Okay. And to prove where I live? Again, there are several possible things listed here. For instance, you could use a bill for council tax, or something else for where you live, such as an insurance certificate. I've got one of those, somewhere among all my papers. But what about bills? Things like phone bills, I mean. As long as it has your address on it, yes. Fine. So a bill for my mobile would do, would it? Uh, I'm afraid it would have to be for a fixed line phone. You could use other types of household bill, though, as long as you get them through the post. How about an electricity bill? That'll say where I live, won't it? If it's in your name and not that of a landlord, yes. It is, so I'll probably take that then. There's one other you might want to use, a vehicle registration document. If you have a car or motorbike or something, of course. No, I haven't, actually. Now, I believe there's a bank actually inside the commercial centre, and I might open an account there, seeing as how that's where I'll be every day. Yeah, that would seem to make sense. I know people who bank there. I actually read about it in a city guide. My cousin picked it up when he was here a couple of years ago, and I made a few notes. Do you mind if I run through them with you now, just to make sure the details haven't changed? Fine, go ahead. OK, first question. It's still a branch of the popular bank, is it? The one with links to Australian banks? No, it's actually been taken over by another big banking group, the Savings Bank. It still seems quite popular, though, especially with people doing business in the Asia-Pacific area. Mm, 
And when is it open? Monday to Saturday? I'll have to check their website for that. Give me a second or two, will you? Sure. Right. I've got it. Customer service, and it's... Just weekdays, I'm afraid. Does it say what their business hours are? I'm just looking for that. It's on a different page for some reason. I think there's been a change at some banks in the last year or so. Yeah, here it is. It's open from 9.30 in the morning till half past three in the afternoon. And it's on the top floor of the main centre building, is it? Next to the travel agency. That's where it used to be, but they've since moved it to a slightly bigger place. It's on the ground floor now. And one last thing on this. Um, I know most banks give incentives to young people to open accounts with them, but apparently this one didn't. Do you know if they're offering anything these days? I'll just check. I'm sure they'd say so on their new clients page if they were. No, there's nothing mentioned here. Oh, that's a pity. I was quite looking forward to getting my free gift. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. There are plenty of other banks within walking distance, you know. It may be worth shopping around to see what they've got to offer. Longer opening hours, including Saturdays, perhaps less crowded. Can you tell me how to get to a couple of them? I know where the commercial centre is, so that's probably my best starting place. Sure. For the Royal Bank, you need to turn left when you leave the centre, go along Market Street past the post office, and turn left up Bridge Street past the Shaw Theatre. Mm. Then you take the first right, you'll see an internet cafe on the other side, and the Royal is just a bit further along on the right, directly opposite the Park Hotel. Okay, I've got that. Um, what about the Northern Bank? For that one, you turn right as you come out of the centre, and go along Market Street until you come to the junction with West Street. Mm. There you turn right again, and carry on up as far as the next junction, where you take a left. You'll see the bank from there. It's the third building on the right. Fine. And the last one, uh, the National Bank? You can go either way from the centre, really. Up West Street or Bridge Street, and then along past City Hall. The bank is on the other side of the road, right next to the tourist office. You can't miss it. Great. Thanks a lot for your help. Any time. Bye. Bye. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3 In this section, you'll hear a conversation between two students in the dining hall of the college. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi Max, how are you? Hi Melanie, I'm fine. In fact, I'm preparing the coming holidays and I want to have a car tour with my friends. That sounds lovely. How is your preparation? Well, I haven't begun yet because I'm not quite sure how to rent a car and what the expense is like and something like this. 
Ha! You've run into the right person. I did the same last holiday, and I can recommend it to you. I went to Avis Rent-A-Car Company, which is at 14A Dover Road, Oxford. Let me write it down. Is it D-O-V-E-R? Yes, and the telephone number is 6340963. But if you book for the first time, dial another number with extension. That is 6340853, extension 54. OK, thank you very much. I'll have a try. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Good morning, Avis Rent-A-Car Company. How can I help you? Hi, I want to book a car for tour. I want to inquire some information about the grade of the cars and the prices. No problem. We offer a wide selection of rental cars to choose from, from luxury car to economy car, compact car, minivan and pickup truck. Well, uh... Luxury car is obviously out of my price range, but compact or economy is not big enough. You know, we have seven persons together. Well, how about a minivan? It's perfect for road trips and will make your journey feel like you're in a living room on wheels. I think that's good. Well, what does it feature? I, I mean, what facilities does it have? Unlike most minivans with manual transmission, the rental minivan cars have feature automatic transmission, air conditioning and AM-FM stereo. If you drive a long, smooth way, you can use the cruise control, which will save you a lot of energy. Good. How much is the price? If you rent an intermediate one, it will cost you £55 each day. If it is standard, the cost is £45 per day. I think the standard is enough. Oh, we have a special 50% discount for weekends, from Friday to Sunday. But that doesn't apply to tax, recovery fees and optional services. Well, what are the optional services? Well, they usually include some extra facilities, like first aid kit or something like that. Uh, I know. We plan to start off on Friday, so we have to prepare one day in advance. I want to book from 30th of April, which is Thursday. And it will end next Monday. OK. Could you leave your name and the driving licence number? My name is Max, and the licence number is M9021. OK. You can pick up the car on Thursday noon. Besides, we offer some optional services like street maps, flashlight and sunsheet. What would you like to have? Mm, flashlight is not necessary, I think. But street maps are useful, especially when we drive in a strange place. As for the sun sheet, I'd like to give that a miss. We don't want to spend too much extra money. OK, Mr Max, thank you for calling. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about sharks. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. It isn't easy for scientists to study sharks in their natural habitat. There's very little that can limit the movement of these fish, and their streamlined bodies are designed to carry them on wide-ranging journeys each day. Scientists, on the other hand, are able to spend only a few hours at a time in the water and are restricted to relatively short distances. Divers, too, are incapable of the rapid, deep dives that come naturally to sharks. As a result, the information we can gain about the behaviour of sharks is usually limited to brief moments in their daily lives. Sharks' activities are often closely tied to their feeding routine. Some species spend daylight hours not far offshore and move in closer to land after dark, presumably to feed. Contrary to popular myths, sharks don't feed on everything that crosses their path. They're carnivores, and different species have different diets, ranging from small shrimps and crabs to dolphins. Sharks are found in various groupings. For example, the species that live on tropical reefs are often observed swimming together in small groups, apparently engaged in hunting or social activities. But at other times, these same species are seen as solitary individuals in search of food. Many social interactions are observed within groups of sharks. When they're feeding on dead whales, for example, large white sharks will often aggressively chase away or bite smaller individuals of the same species and will eat most of the food themselves. Dominance hierarchies between species are also common over access to food. Reef white-tip sharks, for instance, are forced to take second place to silver-tip sharks. Perhaps the most spectacular and well-documented social behaviour by the shark is the readiness for combat displayed by the grey reef shark of tropical Pacific reefs. When one of these sharks is approached rapidly by a diver or cornered against the reef, it exhibits a threatening display which increases in intensity as it becomes more agitated. If the shark is pressed further, it will probably attack. This display seems to be unrelated to defence of any specific territory, so it may represent a defence of personal space or a warning to a potential predator. Can I help you? Yes, please. I'm looking for the accommodation officer. Do you know where she is? I don't, I'm afraid. I can probably help you. My name is Joanna Swift. Do sit down. Thank you. I'd like to move into a college room in October. Can you tell me a bit about what's available? Certainly. We have two blocks for women students. The first is Ridgeway House. There are two types of room, an ordinary bedroom with desk, etc., which is $230 a week. That's with food, of course, but not ensuite facilities. And then there's the bigger study bedroom, which is $270 a week. Mm, I think I'm more interested in the cheaper room, but are they very small? Well, they're not very big, but there's a large common room with a TV on each floor, so there's somewhere to go and talk to friends or see the news. The university campus is a five-minute bus ride, or 20 if you walk. Oh, that's not so far. No, but there is something that you may find a problem. I'm afraid Ridgeway House is closed in the summer, but not the winter vacation. Oh, that is a problem, actually. I need somewhere for the whole year. Hmm. International House may suit you better. It's much cheaper, only $130 to share a room or $150 for a single room. Food isn't included in the price, but there's a kitchen on every floor and washing machines on the ground floor. That sounds better. But I wouldn't want to share. I'm such a tidy person, you know. I would find sharing difficult. <laughs> I'd like to have a single room if one is available. Well, there are a few singles still available for next year, but you'll have to make up your mind fairly soon, as it's such a popular hall. Why don't you go and take a look? The address is 27 Whitaker. That's spelt W-H-I-T. A-K-E-R. 
place. Yes, I'll do that. There are also quite a few facilities you might be interested in. There's an outdoor swimming pool for the warmer months, and an all-weather volleyball court. I think I'm probably more interested in having access to a computer. No problem. There's a computer room situated in the basement. It's run by volunteers and is always open in the evenings and at weekends. Now I should tell you that there's really only one rule in International House, and that is that no smoking is permitted anywhere on the premises. They also have an unofficial policy of no noise after ten o'clock at night. That won't be a problem. I will go and have a look, and then come back. Would I need to pay a deposit today? It would be better, and you also need to fill in the application form. The fee is twenty-five dollars, which you pay now with a further one hundred dollars deposit when you get the key. I'm sure you'd enjoy living there. It's a lovely building. And was only finished last year. It sounds brilliant. Thank you very much for your help. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.